Hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and I want to thank you so much for joining me as we look into God's Word to see His timeless truth. Now, how many of you grew up in a situation where you were taught that you earn God's love by the things that you do? Essentially, you were brought up in a legalistic situation, a a legalistic household, and, and perhaps you still have some of those tendencies within you. But then, as you discover the freedom that you have in Christ and Christ's love for you and that God is working within you through that process to allow you to see His love, allow you to see how to love others better, As you go through that process, you realize the freedom we have in Christ. Now, the freedom we have in Christ is huge. We realize that it was Christ who did the work on the cross, that he broke that barrier, that through faith in him, that you can have life and have it abundantly. However, if you look across the spectrum of even Christians, you'll see a wide range of people who hold the legalistic practices. They believe that you have to do this or that. I'm not talking about sin issues. They might put it as a sin issue, but they couldn't go to Scripture and verse and say, this is what Scripture exactly says. So we're not talking about that, but we're talking about opinions. We're talking about issues where there is freedom in Christ, not to do that anymore. Now, if you think about it, back in the time that Paul was writing this, the Jewish citizens of Rome really had been in a situation through Judaism that they were trying to essentially have all these extra burdens put on them that God didn't have. The, the, the Pharisees and, and the laws that they put on them in order so that they could think they were more godly than somebody else. And in fact, if you look around it, that's what a lot of religions are with Christ. It's not about what you do, but what Christ has done for you. And in that, you say, wow, the mercies of God are amazing. And you love God and you love other people. Now, as we mature in Christ, we understand the rich truths at a different level, but we realize that the Holy Spirit is working within us to draw us closer to himself. That's what we'll be looking about in Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 23. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the love we have in you, We thank you for the rich truths that are in Scripture. Help us to know you better. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. So as we dig in, remember, we're coming from a situation where Paul really has been emphasizing what does it look like to live life in community. And earlier in 14, he talked about the stronger and the weaker brother. He talked a lot about the, the, the weaker brother. Now he's going to talk a lot about the stronger brother. And what does it look like to live in a relationship with other believers where maybe they do hold to things from the past? I mean, if you think about it, there are a number of people that hold the practices that maybe they're not written out in Scripture, but through tradition or other such things, that they do them because it makes them feel as though they're following after God. And so in that, God's going to say, this is how you treat them because they're ultimately God's servant. And ultimately, God is the one who is working within their lives. There's only one Holy Spirit, and we're not them. And so as we understand how God has taken us from a position and allowed us to mature in him, we understand that he's doing the same in the other thing. However, in the culture that we live in today, we are all about our rights, selfishness. And we try to, in in whatever way, to assert our selfishness 
and at times try to make it spiritual. But ultimately, what it is is we like idols and our preferences can become our idols. Well, that's kind of what Paul's addressing here. So, let's dig in as, as he's talking about how do we live in life in community with other believers? Starts off with a therefore. And I think therefore is ultimately what he's been talking about in chapter 14, even in back to the end of chapter 11 and, and some of that. But I think a lot of times it talk, it's talking about all of us are before the judgment seat of Christ. And so on that, God is judge. And so it says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Ultimately, Christ is that judge. He is the one who decides. And with that, it says, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. So there, there's actually in the Greek a word play between judgment and decide. They're, they're similar in how they are. But what it's saying is, all right, understand that God is judge over all and we're not that judge. And in that, that we have to decide to not put judgment upon another and create what they, he gives two words fairly similar stumbling block or hindrance, the idea of to cause somebody to fall. Now in this, uh, it, it is not a situation necessarily of preference, but of something that would hinder, impede their growth in the Lord. And that they might go, man, there is such a situation that has arisen that I, I don't necessarily see it's not an issue of sin, but would make them separate maybe from the body of believers. That would make them go, I don't want to be part of this body of believers. And in that, hinder the growth that God is doing in them through you and through other believers. And so he says, don't do this. And he's mainly here going to be talking about the weak uh, as, as for ours when he's talking about the brother, but he's giving ammunition or or. or encouragement to the strong. This is how you are to live. Verse 14. I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. Now again, this is not just all subjectiveness. There's actual lines and understandings about what is true and what is not. You just can't say, well, it's true for me. Is it true for you? No, no. What he's saying is, understand, he wants people to follow after him with their heart. I mean, back in Mark 7, uh, kind of in verses 18 through 23, he was actually talking about it. And he says, you know, the idea is it's not what enters into a person that defiles a person, uh, since it does not enter our heart, but into our stomach and expelled. He declares all foods clean. And this is what comes out of a person defiles them. For within, for within, out of the heart, a man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these things come with, uh, from within and defile a person. So what he's saying is, again, the issue is, is it okay or not to eat that food? Already decided. It, it, we can see it in scripture. But ultimately, understand that God looks at the heart. And he's saying, all right. What I want is somebody who follows after me, who earnestly believes what they're doing, they're doing to the glory of God. And so in that, he says, don't, don't take that away. Again, he's not talking about issues of sin. He, he's talking about the idea of respecting other people's convictions. Um, and, and in that, we do that all the time. 
As a pastor, I do that regularly in how I live my life. There may be somebody that holds to something that I don't necessarily hold to, but I'm not going to jump on their case every single time. Every time somebody misspeaks about something of Scripture, do you have to be like, oh, wait, stop, and, and clarify every little thing? Now, there are some things that are clearly important to delineate and say, well, actually, Scripture says this. On, on the essentials, so important to do those things. But where there's debate and other things, or maybe it's clear, maybe you go, all right, I understand that they're growing in the Lord. Maybe they've only known the Lord for a couple of years, and you've known the Lord for years. And, and so in that, you are showing them respect. You are showing them honor, which early in Romans we're all called to do, and not doing anything, and, and understanding that they are trying to live out the Christian life the best that they can. And then it's going to give explanation in verse 15. It's when it says four. And... It's really concerning the heart of someone. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And in this, it's saying, all right, you have the freedom to eat this meat, but don't do it. Don't do it because it grieves, it makes sorrowful, it causes pain to this other believer. And in that, what we're called to do is to walk in love with one another as believers. That is no longer occurring. So think back, the two commandments, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. You're no longer walking in that call that we're called to love. If you do that, so he's saying, in the freedom that you have in Christ, restrain yourself, not exerting your own self-will, but out of love for a brother or sister in the Lord, you're changing how you live because he also is a child of God. He also is redeemed by God. And he is being, God is working within his heart. In fact, God is the one who draw, draws us. God is the one who allows us to mature. We're not called. God may use us in situations, but it is ultimately God. And so this idea of destroying is going to be brought back up in, in verse 20, where it talks about how Christ is working in them. And so what we need to understand is that freedom doesn't give us the allowance to sin, to, to speak evilly of a brother, to, to mock, to ridicule, to, to put them down. Uh, do not fail to love your brother, the weaker brother. Do not do that. And I'll give explanations further on. So do not let what is regarded as good be spoken as evil. And so it says, all right, that which is good, that which you have the freedom in doing, don't let it become a situation where they're like, man, that brother is not loving anymore. They do this and they do that, and I can't see how they're spiritual at all. And that's because they're not there yet. They don't see in which you're operating so you're choosing to limit the way in which you act around them. Again, this is not in a sinful way. People have tried to justify what they do in all sorts of manner and shape. But essentially, so much of it is rooted in legalism. And we tend to have that tendency to want to do that, to put ourselves above others. But it's like, don't do that because we do have freedom in Christ, and we are also called not to be legalistic. So if you say, all right, I have this freedom to do this, you're doing this, you shouldn't do this. Again, it's not a, a sinful, they're choosing uh, not to 
do something that is going against God, but they're not exercising some of the freedoms that they have in Christ. To, to berate them, to look down upon them, would be tender them. I mean, he doesn't want that. In fact, you yourself become selfish and prideful. And you forget the reason you have that freedom is because of the grace of God. And, and so you totally distort what it means to have freedom in Christ. And in that, he says, in verse 17, and I think this kind of sums it up of where our heart needs to be for the kingdom of God. And, and again, I, I, when it says kingdom of God, it means a number of different things, but uh, obviously in, in which God rules and reigns. And that is, again, he is ruling and reigning in your life. So uh, kind of not already, but we're also looking forward to what is in the future to come. So understand that it's yes and yes in the future. And understand it that we are being changed in that. So it's not a matter of eating or drinking. So those are minor things for, for which, yes, they're important, but you miss out on the most primarily primary thing if you don't recognize that it is uh, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So, essentially, it comes down is the way in which we're called to live, we cannot live in and of ourselves. It is only through God that and the Holy Spirit that we can do any of this. Again, it is by and through the Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done, that we live to, for God, that we're, we are declared righteous, we're growing in righteousness, in sanctification, but in that, the fruits of the Spirit, and as you think about it, is peace, which is the idea that it comes only from God, only from God can we have peace, but as we yield ourselves to Him, we increasingly have peace in our life when we walk with Him as well as joy, the idea or the state of delight. And that is because we're yielded to the Holy Spirit. So it continues on in verse 18, it says this. And it goes, whoever, thus, and, and I think it's kind of pulling back to, uh, it's kind of pulling back to 17, serves Christ, is acceptable to God, and approved by men. So we don't want to become a stumbling block. We want to live in accordance with God. And when we go ahead and not make issues about uh, legalistic things, which, I'm, I mean, think about it. The Jewish people were right there. Paul is giving kind of through God these protections. Don't fall into legalism again. I mean, you can just look around the church in America today and probably throughout the world of the legalism that has crept in. Now, understand, maybe your temptation is like, let's go ahead and root that all out. But in doing that, you might develop pride and legalism yourself. And so he's saying, all right, let God do this. Let God do the work. And in that, you're a servant of Christ, which is what you're called to do. And people will look at you and say, ah, that person's different. The love that they have for their brothers and sisters in the Lord is different. And I want that. Let me know that. So verse 19. So then let us pursue what makes peace and for mutual upbuilding. So we're supposed to seek those things. When was the last time that you pursued peace and building up brothers with another person? When you really put energy into that, I think far too often we can easily tear people down. But when was the last time you encouraged somebody? Recently, I heard this, and I, I don't know whether it's true or not. The most encouraging words spoken about a man is at his funeral. 
Again, just that idea that many people have things that they would say good about an individual, but that individual never hears them. Let's not be like that. Let's try to be better at being encouraging. I know that that's something I need to work on. In fact, the other day, I confessed to my kids that I need to do that more. I need to build people up. I need to be better at that. Verse 20, and then really it's showing the strong, or the strong showing that they have concern for the weak. Do not, uh, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. See, the, the word destroy has come back up. The work of God, the work that God is doing within them, how God is molding them, shaping them. Again, hopefully you're more mature than the day you trusted in the Lord. And hopefully it's because of God's work within you as you yield towards Christ. Now, have you ever left a church, left an organization because of legalism, because of infighting? So many people have. And they, because they were exerting their own rights instead of surrendering to God, saying, I want to be a servant to God. And they got hung up on all these minor issues. All the meanwhile, not living in righteousness, not living in peace, not living in joy. In fact, probably very sad and hurt and destroyed. That's not what he wants. And I would say that many Christians have that story of that. Everything is indeed clean. So he's going back. He's saying what he holds, being the stronger believer, he understands your position is correct. But it is not wrong for anyone to make another, but, but it is wrong for another, any, anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. So don't put that block, don't put that sunburn into stumbling into what it is already talked about in verse 13. Don't stumble because over the issue of food. If he hasn't made it clear, he's just kind of repeating it. In fact, that chiastic structure is all within theirs, but ultimately it comes down to living righteously for God and for his kingdom and being a servant to for God. And so don't make him stumble. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Can you think of situations in your life where you go, all right, I'm not going to push this, maybe a theological idea, maybe a, a way in which you live upon somebody else and, and, and really kind of go after them and go, you're not a good Christian because of this, 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 and this. No, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to act in love. But since you understand what you're doing and understand where it is in Scripture and that it is right, continue on in that way. Uh, but not in front of a brother or sister in the Lord. Uh, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. I think the assurance is the, the understanding of what it is. Don't make a big issue about it. Don't just bring it up every single issue. Do you know somebody that has like a hobby horse? Like, or like they, they have a issue that they talk about nonstop. And the moment they find out that maybe you differ from them, it's just like they try to berate you to believe what they believe. Again, you're going to have different views on everything. And don't destroy the relationship, the fellowship with other brothers because of it. And it says this, Blessed is one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. So, again, this is a blessing. A blessing is given to the strong, not to the weak. But that a person should understand that they have freedom in Christ. And that is a blessing. And in that, you can stand before God and go, I'm, I'm good. I know God. God understands where I am and I am approved. And so in that, I don't have to assert my right. I'm going to live humbly seeking to glorify God, concerned about his kingdom and making his kingdom known and the gospel going forth. 
And then it comes back to the weak. It says, but whoever has doubt uh, is, con uh, is commended if he, condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So what it's saying is, just because uh, you, you don't see that yet, don't let somebody beat you, make you stumble to the point where you're just going, all right, I'm going to do this to win their favor, God's favor, in, in the sense of going against what you believe in your heart is right. Because God looks at the heart. That's what he's concerned about. Again, look at it, study it. But don't come to a point of like, man, I'm going to do this and they'll do that and we can live together in harmony, encouraging and building one another up. That's what he wants. Living a surrendered life to him, to God, is what he wants. Not pleasing self for others. God wants unity in the church. And that comes as we deal with one another in love. So in that love, what we need to do is really seek how can we live for God by surrendering our rights, not following after the own idols that our idol heart factories like to make, to be there for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and understand that God is working within them. Understand that things of peace and righteousness, those are the important things to God. And so... Don't puff yourself up. Don't, don't, don't force non, just opinions, non-essential things such as food and other things upon other people, even if you know they're right. For the sake of unity, for the sake of your weaker brother in Christ. So that they don't stumble. I mean, think about it. Somebody could be, you'd be like, oh, that's not how it is at all. And you go, blah, 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 blah. And then they go, man, I feel like a fool or I don't, I still don't agree with that. And so they leave the fellowship. That's not what God's about. Again, we should know truth, examine it, look at his word. But we also extend grace to others. And that's how we're called to live, to be concerned about righteousness, peace, and joy. And knowing that it is Christ who works in us and through us. And so in that, we love God and loving God and serving God. We love others for the purpose of love within the body of believers. That's what he wants. Let's go ahead and just go before the Lord in prayer, asking him to help us as we try to live this out. Lord, I pray for those that are struggling with relationships with other people. Maybe the other person doesn't see what they're doing, isn't quite in line with scripture. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be quick to listen and slow to speak that we would be concerned about building up one another, encouraging people, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would create unity within the church so that we can grow in you and really experience the freedom that we have in Christ. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. Thank you so much for taking time to go through God's word with me and be blessed.